Edie Addison, Nicole Angel, Maria Blanco, Janine Bourne, Rabbi Yossi Chesney, Lieutenant Lori Claiborne, Felicia Coleman, Leslie Corbin, Dr. Susanna Craig, Ms. Melissa Drescher, Representative Lance Harris, Dr. Michelle Jubert, Linda Lambert, Latrice LaCour, Dr. Tony Lede, Dr. Ashley Lucas, Captain Aaron Marcel, Nora McCarstall, Chrisella Matoyer, Joy Mitchell, Senator Beth Mizell, Dr. Tamanika Odinga, Jonathan Pierce, Jennifer Roberts, Kelly Taylor White, Representative Chris Turner, Kari Wahid, Shanoa Webb, Paula Polito, Dr. Libby Sonia. We do not have a quorum. Okay. So a meeting without a quorum of the membership present does not constitute a meeting in which business can be conducted. However, the LDOE will present the information outlined on the agenda for discussion among the members and public comment will be accepted. So the first item is approval of the minutes held um, May 18th, 2023. May I get a motion to approve the minutes? Thank you, Dr. Odinga, and a second? Thank you, Felicia. All right, and then the um, next item will be consideration of an update report regarding the 2023 Early Childhood Care and Education Advisory Council, quarterly report quarter two. Good morning, I'm Karen Powell, Deputy Assistant Superintendent for Early Childhood Care and Education here at the department. And today we will be bringing you the quarter two report for the Early Childhood Advisory Council. So first we'll talk about the Early Childhood Accountability System. In quarter two, which is April through June of each year, um, in quarter two, the department and community network lead agencies continue to support local sites to implement the early childhood accountability system. So they completed spring class observations in April through June, and that totaled more than 3,000 class observations and more than 58,000 minutes of early childhood instruction. So there were 510 infant observations, 1,037 toddler observations, and 1,505 pre-K observations. Of the total local observations, 73 were conducted at family child care sites that had opted into academic approval. So the department and community network lead agencies work together to close out the academic year in additional ways as well. 
teachers completed the third and final checkpoint for Teaching Strategies Gold in May. And again, the networks observed more than 500,000 minutes of care in the spring observation cycle total. So the previous slide told you about what was done in April through June, but this slide tells you about the entirety of the spring observation cycle. So that included more than 1,000 infant observations, more than 2,000 toddler observations, and 3,600 pre-K observations. During... Can I ask questions here? Sure. So when will we have the... When will the performance profiles be available for us to review as an advisory council? Um, and to be able to see, like, the movement, you know, going from position to position. So that should be included in the quarter four report, and the performance profiles should be released by November. Right, and then additionally, community network lead agencies successfully improved enrollment and access by increasing family engagement and outreach programs in quarter two. So community network lead agencies are implementing innovative strategies such as creating more robust public awareness campaigns, using multimedia approaches to reach as many families as possible with multiple approaches, for example, through TV, through print, through social media campaigns, some networks have hired a marketing firm to promote the network's mission and enrollment, raise awareness of the importance of early childhood care and education, and make more families aware of the opportunities available to them in the community. They've provided informational campaigns to specifically inform families of young children with disabilities, children whose home language may not be English, and children experiencing homelessness about finding placements that best meet their needs. And they've increased network presence at other community events besides their own coordinated enrollment events. So they really looked at what are the community celebrations taking place and making sure they have a presence there. What are events that take place at the library where families can be found and having a presence there. And also participating in health events in the communities. So some other examples are that there were um, commercials run for weeks, radio ads, billboards with Lamar advertising. Um, some parishes use direct messaging systems like Bright by Text and Remind to communicate information about enrollment processes with their communities. So many, many different events and opportunities being utilized. In quarter two, we continued the B to three seats pilot that began in 2020 to 2021. It was projected to end, unfortunately, in June 30th, but quite fortunately, the Louisiana legislature invested more than ever in early childhood care and education, enabling the department to allocate funding for the 2023-2024 CCAP B to three seats pilot program. So in quarter two itself, by the close of that quarter, B to three seats were serving 3,560 children across 30 networks in the state. More than 500 infants, more than 800 one-year-olds, more than 1,000 two-year-olds, and more than 1,000 three-year-olds. You'll hear in upcoming quarterly reports. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, when, when you're talking about those numbers, I just want to understand, that's, uh, is that what we currently have, but we're encouraging more to come in, right? And so what is, okay, I'll just ask you, what is the waiting list? Is there uh, staff? What, what is the connection right now between, I'm just gonna cut to the chase, okay. The, the waiting list, the funding, and staff that could respond to additional funding and fill the waiting list. What, what does that look like? So the B to three seats are different from the regular CCAP voucher system that you're all the most familiar with. Remember the, the B to three seats pilot was an allocated seats pilot to make sure that we could provide seats to communities based on identified need and provide seats more widespread 
the voucher program is really a first come first serve program. And so what we're looking to do as we move forward in the future is create a hybrid CCAP program that includes both the voucher program and the allocated seats because they meet different needs of families. So some families need that voucher program to be able to be flexible, to be able to be mobile, but we also need those allocated seats in order to help stabilize the industry. Uh, I'm sure that there are providers here who could probably testify as to how it helped to know they were having that stable source of income and could manage their budget a little bit differently than with the prior voucher only program. So these are children being served in addition to the children being served in the traditional CCAP voucher system is the first part of that answer. Now we are rolling children off the wait list because of the additional investment in the state. And so we are sending out letters to families month by month. So for example, the families that were certified as eligible to the wait list in October, 2022, November and December have already received a mailed notification and phone messages from the department saying, congratulations, we now have funding for seats. Please return this form that confirms that you still need care. And that lets us know if there were any changes from when you submitted your original application. So we have already moved more than 200 families and more than 350 children off of the wait list as of a week ago. And more are moving off every day. 350 children and so we will keep rolling them off we're moving month by month we're um, I believe today we're sending out the January 2023 letters to families and we'll continue with February March April May and June letters and so we're we're really able to we're sending those about a week to two weeks apart and we're able to roll off the families as those forms come in geographically is this around the state or is this con are you seeing this growth concentrated in an urban it, tell me where the growth is. in terms of the ccap voucher seats we would have to see whether we could analyze it unfortunately our ccap data systems are very old it's very hard to pull certain data from them that wasn't already programmed into the system we are working as we build the new system and work to transition into it, trying to figure out all the different kinds of reports we want, such as that one, in order to be able to get critical data on who's being served, where, and how. But what we do know about allocated seats, like the CCAP B to three seat system, is that that allows us to ensure that parishes across the entire state are getting reserved some seats for children that the needs of all parishes are being met. So we expanded this year. We have not yet expanded to every parish, but we did expand to an additional 12 parishes for 2023, 2024. And essentially we gave seats for 2023, 2024 to every parish that asked for them. Our team continues to work to encourage those parishes that have not yet asked for them to ask for them. And I have a question in regards to sustainability of the funding. Yes, so thank you for providing me with my segue. <laughs> so what I also wanted to say regarding this slide is um, really what you see at the bottom of the slide. We are developing strategies that will permanently transition the allocated seats into our CCDF program. And so we will work to permanently have a blending of both types of seats in the future so that the B to three seats program will not be at risk of disappearing as it was this year. Now we are always at, um, you know, funding is never guaranteed. We feel fairly confident about federal funding. It has not decreased. It has gradually increased, but I suppose nothing is ever guaranteed. It's important to keep telling our story and how important early care and education is. I am very grateful to the legislature for the additional state funding, um, 51.7 additional dollars for early care and education. And so I know that many people in this room will be working very, very hard to try to maintain that and or increase that. So of the networks that are not participating or have not requested, was there a 
specific reasoning behind it? I don't know that they have identified that. I don't think we've asked that yet. But I do think that's something that we would be inquiring as to moving forward. And I really do think that when you look at it, it's more often rural networks. Um, we have some staff members who used to serve in those networks where you may be very familiar. That person in early childhood plays every role. They are not only the early childhood lead, they might have been the early childhood through 12 lead. And so I think you know we will continue to work with those networks. We'll also work with kind of consortium groups, you know, regional groups like CCRNRs that serve multiple parishes. We're going to have to work to strategize if that parish does not feel that it has the capacity to do this work, who might be willing to step in and assist because we don't want any parishes or any children and families left behind. Okay. Jen, yes, sir. Quick question, is there any intent right now to convene the participating parishes and kind of get at some understanding of how the program's working now, um, what things might need to be edited, suggested, et cetera, before it becomes the permanent program or it transitions from pilot over? Absolutely. But in addition to that, what we're really doing before that as well is finding out what the federal rules would be because that will dictate a lot. Um, so, you know, there could be some things that are working that unfortunately the federal law will not allow us to continue to do. And so we're working to really get a sense of how to transition that in according to CCDF rules and then get feedback because we will absolutely, again, um, going back to answer your question further, we'll be bringing policy back to this board to eventually approve but we'll also be bringing it to stakeholder groups and the work group to review, give feedback on, help us decide revisions to before it comes to the council for final approval. And then how many children are you um, projecting to serve in the beta three seats for this fiscal year? More than 6,000. And how are you able to do that with the streams of funding? Yeah. So we have more federal funding than we had a year ago. The federal omnibus bill increased that funding. We also have some additional stimulus dollars that we were able to put in to the program, the significant increase by the state. And then in addition to that, by turning on the wait list, which we had to do to ensure that we would have enough funding through attrition, et cetera, you do end up, we ended up saving some money that we're now able to put into the program. We also were able, because of such a, an influx of stimulus funds, to wait on using some of our CCDF funds. So then the question is, is what's the fiscal cliff going to be from those COVID dollars? Because at one point, we, we heard no B to 3 seats. And then all of a sudden, we're almost doubling the seats. So what's the potential fiscal cliff here that we're looking at? So looking at modeling, it looks like through natural attrition and then three-year-olds moving on into four-year-old programs that we should be able to move in a stable way from this year to next year. Now, we might not be able to serve as many children in B to 3 seats, but we should be able to continue the care that we've already started for the children in the B to 3 seats. And we will certainly look to see if there's any additional money that we can use to bring in a new infant cohort, for example. But we would at least be able to continue care for the children that would be served this year. That's helpful. I think it would be helpful for our this advisory council to understand attrition numbers and the pace in which kids roll off um, to, to understand the ebb and flow better, especially as you know certain funding will go away and not come back. And as we, many of us in this room, advocate for increased in investment in this, just to understand that would be helpful. Thank you. I have a question, Ms. Karen. Mm -hmm. So Thanks. I wanted to know, approximately how much money was given to um, CCAP B to 3 and then how much funding was given to just CCAP vouchers? Because I didn't even realize that CCAP voucher people were rolling off the CCAP list. Mm -hmm. So we use, this year we are using our state dollars for the CCAP B to 3 seats, so that 87 million. And then we're using our regular CCDF funding 
which is about 114 million for CCAT voucher seats. Okay, here you can see some information about another important source of funding for early childhood care and education, the Early Childhood Education Fund. So as you know, that is a state fund, an incentive fund that provides up to a dollar for dollar match to local communities who raise local dollars, non-federally sourced, non-state sourced dollars. And so in quarter two, the department was able to allocate funding to seven community network lead agencies that raised qualifying local funds. Now you see that there is a wide variance in the dollars that were raised. You've got um, some programs, you know, raising a thousand, five thousand, and then you've got other programs like Orleans that has been extremely successful in a uh, millage. But I think what's really encouraging is to see that each year more networks are striving to raise something and are really focused on this fund, are aware of this fund, are trying to move forward with this. Um, I will say, you know, these funds all come from different sources. Some are from philanthropic organizations, some are from parish budgets, some are from millages, some are from private donors. But I think that's very encouraging to see that there's no one route, that there are multiple ways that communities can raise the dollars. Karen, um, there's just a correction. It's 1,800 in Orleans, not 1,100. Thank you. And apologies for that, Jen. We'll update it online. Also in quarter two, um, as you are aware, we had some stimulus funds liquidating as of September 30th, a few days from now. But for a few stimulus funds, we have one more year. They liquidate at the end of 2023, 2024. And so we again did a third and final round of Believe allocations to networks. And so we offered this Believe funding in four different categories one to promote stabilization efforts, one to support access expansion, one for additional quality improvements, and one for family engagement. And so you can see here the allocations that were awarded to different networks. All networks that applied for funding, received funding, and we've seen networks do inspiring things with this funding. So providing bonuses or stipends for early childhood educators, helping to provide benefits, equipping new classrooms with furnishings, providing high quality curriculum or supports, developmentally appropriate materials. And I'm particularly excited about the real increased focus on family engagement that networks and the department have. And so there have been more family informational meetings, engagement trainings, family literacy development trainings, subscriptions to text-based programs that support families in understanding their child's development and helping to facilitate that healthy development. So very excited to see what else the networks do with that funding this year. On that, it would really be helpful. I, I mean, it would give me some, I guess we all want peace of mind. I, I'd really like to know that we're reaching out to people that may be a little harder to reach. To me, the greatest need is, you know, we talk about maternal health. It, it's a challenge to reach people when the services aren't there. And I know I did see a bill there. Great. And, and I thought that was incredibly uh well done because we don't have broadband you know there's there's drunks I keep beating because we're in isolation and if if, if parents are never made aware of services we're never going to change the outcomes that we're trying to change so I, 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 I don't know who could provide that you know there's some algorithm that's going to tell me where these uh, family engagements for instance are taking place but I'd really like to 
future. I will put that information. I'll also say that in some upcoming quarterly reports, we're doing a lot of work with our preschool development grant, for example, and we have awarded some subgrants on family engagement work, trying to continue to learn what works, what seems to be effective in different types of communities. We know there's not really one right answer that it's important for communities to be able to inform what they do. I know at one point there was a conversation across agencies about the, the Parent Training Leadership Institute. Um, and I was just curious as you were talking about parent engagement, family engagement, like what, what that was going to look like, if that's still a thing across agencies to support that work. So we're really allowing the community networks to determine, yes, at the state level, we're really letting, we've made it another local effort to ask the locals what they want to do with different projects and programs. But there was a point, and I don't know if it's these funds or different funds, that with LDH, DCFS, and LDOE, that there was a conversation of launching a statewide net network of the Parent Leadership Training Institute. So is that not a thing anymore on, from LDOE, or have you all? I'm just curious. I don't think that's something we're pursuing at this time, because I think it's there's a concern about that be, being perceived as advocacy, and not something we can necessarily fund with our federal dollars. Right. Ready Start Networks have also continued to do their innovative work. And so, actually, as I was um, just beginning to discuss, in quarter two, specifically in May, five Ready Start Networks began participation in a workforce planning subgrant, and they are studying local level data related to workforce development, workforce recruitment, and workforce retention, because I think we all know and all agree that workforce stabilization and workforce advancement is one of the most critical issues being faced in every community in the state, um, not just child care, but certainly very, very important in early care and learning. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question. Um, what are some examples of the um, subgrant that so they're very, very early on <laughs> in their work, so I don't know that we have a whole lot of details yet, but some of the examples that they said they wanted to explore are pathways for parents or guardians of young children, including teen parents, to become educators through promotion and scholarships, expanding local efforts to use incentive pay, retention bonuses, wage enhancements, incentivized professional development, and other stabilization strategies based on lessons learned to date. Some are hiring a workforce consultant to assist in researching and developing a plan for viable local incentives and ways to address and advance the economic well-being of the workforce. And some are partnering with community organizations in their areas to recruit a more diverse workforce. So that work has just begun and we look forward to giving you updates after they've completed those subgrants. The five Ready Start Networks who are engaged in that work are Rapides, St. Charles, St. Tammany, Tangipahoa, and Washington Parishes. The five parishes? Yes. Rapides, St. Charles, St. Tammany, Tangipahoa, and Washington Parishes. Is that something being done uh, as a team effort with like the community colleges because uh, I do the JAG interviews. Okay? One of the most encouraging things that happened with the mock interview with the young woman at Franklin at High School who wanted to go into preschool teaching. And she was paying her own dual enrollment. Uh, I mean, that's absurd. So are, are we coordinating this with... Uh, guidance counselors or community colleges to, to are we? I think that some are. Again, I think that it looks different in every network because what we found to be so effective and successful in the past is the creativity of each local network. I think, I'll, I'll pull back and I'll restate that. I think what we found to be successful is a combination of 
letting each individual network really explore what they think works for them and then sharing that information about all networks with all networks so the networks have even more ideas and more strategies to employ. Senator Mizell, um, this, uh, I'm representing the Board of Regents and we do have a pilot in Washington Parish that is covering the expenses for um, dual enrollment for early childhood and low tenure and teaching professionals. And it started this, this fall. And then in addition, there is the family engagement and leadership grant that I mentioned. And those networks are working on robust communication strategies to expand family engagement, the leadership development of parents, and sharing of best practices that most effectively prepare children for success in school and beyond. So the five Ready Start networks who are engaged in that work currently are Assumption, Caldwell, Lafayette, and St. Landry Parishes, and then Children's Coalition, which is working with multiple parishes. So East Carroll, Lincoln, Morehouse, Washita, and Richmond. So I think that'll be very interesting to see what we learn at individual local levels as well as at this you know, regional Ready Start Network level. And so they're analyzing their current practices of communication and outreach to families, thinking really carefully about what practices to adapt, which to adopt, which to abandon, building upon communication strategies, focusing on families of young children with disabilities, non-English speaking families and families in rural areas, providing families with more opportunities for input and decision making, elevating the voices of families and communities, focused on family and community needs and feedback from families, and sharing best practices with families regarding supporting young children's development and learning so that parents and caregivers can be full partners in preparing children for success in school. Regarding efforts in quarter two to support teachers' success, the department continued to provide professional development opportunities for early learning teachers across the state. 17 early childhood ancillary certificate programs provided course content, coaching, and support to teachers to prepare them for successful classroom interactions. Child care resource and referral agencies conducted training and coaching that focused on instructional support and engaged support for learning, those domains where we continue to want to increase and improve scores. They also targeted sites with overall scores in the approaching proficient range and classrooms with new teachers or low scores. And those CCRNRs provided more than 4,000 hours of coaching in quarter two and more than 600 hours of training in quarter two, including two family child care sites. Whereas we have felt a great deal of support from PTAC staff here at the state level and pathways as well, but we are very, very concerned about the great teacher shortage of uh, qualified teachers and feel as though particularly now with the CCAP teachers getting teachers ready very quickly, we wondered if perhaps we could increase the number of cohorts now because recently we were very pleased to get the funding for CCAP B3. However, the fast turnaround after we've been approved for these funds for the cohorts, it's, it's ended. So now we're trying to find ways to finance all of our folks, our teachers, who will be lead teachers in these classrooms, they must be, how to get them funded, maybe do another cohort, whatever. I just wondered what, what, what are the plans here for that? We're really investigating that because we were blessed with stimulus funds to be able to run additional cohorts, but we're looking into what the plan will be now that those stimulus funds are ending because you know, unfortunately the state receives a limited number of quality support dollars and so we have to figure out how we're going to prioritize cohorts moving forward.
also had a question. I know our local CCRNR has had problems with uh, returning to in-person tournaments that require me and their attendance has been really low um, and they've had to cancel a lot of tournaments that um, staff need. Um, is there anything being done in the staff um, as far as that requirement? I have not heard that, so thank you for flagging it for me and we'll look into it. Ms. Powell, I have a question. So with our Head Start programs, our lead teachers are not required. Our teachers in lots of our Head Start programs have degrees. So they're not required to have a CDA. However, the Head Start standards very clearly state that our uh, co-teachers or paraprofessionals that are in the room are required to have CDAs. Well, as a Head Start program, as well as other programs, just talking with other programs, we are having difficulty um, with meeting the standard for our individuals to have ancillary certificates. So they have gone through and they meet the CDA standard. Um, however, the Louisiana Department of Education will not grant them an ancillary certificate because they are not participating in one of these programs. So are there, has there been any talk about that or can we have discussion in regards to that? Because it definitely is a barrier that we are facing um, in the last few months. Several programs have mentioned it. And so just wanting to look at what are our avenues for Head Start staff. Thank you for flagging that as well because I, I recognize that that's different than what Dr. Odinga was mentioning, but I think it's part of a larger um, set of you know, policy revisions that I think we're going to have to consider to the Early Childhood Ancillary Certificate Policy. Um, what quality of measure is used for these particular programs that make them unique? So currently there's not a program that is outright measuring them. We do have, we are working to get an accountability system in place and have a vendor identify, yeah, for program, oh, for program approval, I'm sorry, did you mean program approval yeah. or for, okay, my apologies, thank you. Yes, so there's an application process twice a year that interested programs can apply for. Yeah. Policy and so are there that. any Head Start programs that have applied that you're aware of? I am not aware of any, no. But that's another interesting flag. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, and, you know, maybe we could work to recruit someone. So thank you, and I'm sure you'll be hearing more from us about that. I wonder too with the workforce issue, like, because I know there's a finite amount of money to be able to go through pathways and, and have these teachers, but I wonder if this is a place where we can reach out to philanthropy um, and other places to help support more cohorts of teachers now that these COVID dollars are going away. Um, and as you look at policy revisions and maybe a rubric of scoring ECAC programs and all those things, it might be something. To think about as well. Yes, so we do have that rubric in place in Bulletin, but we've not yet been able to launch that accountability system yet, so we are very, very eager to do so in helping us make these decisions in a more data-driven way moving forward. Thank you. Right. No, I think that's, I mean, I think that's a really exciting possibility to think through, um, especially since I did not know for sure that Head Start might have funding for this, but I know that it is a requirement and that they generally fund things that they have requirements for. So I think that's a really, really exciting prospect for us to follow up on. Thank you. St. Charles Parish no can be program and how to talk about the power of ways to get this Of course, we I also don't know whether, you know, we might be able to facilitate conversations where Head Starts might be willing to partner with SE approved ECACs to offer cohorts for their mm -hmm. team members. So I think there's a lot we can discuss in the follow up. Thank you very, very much. All right, additional efforts supporting teachers to be successful. 
is supporting young children with disabilities by providing teachers and leaders with training and materials for the administration of developmental screening. So in quarter two, community network lead agencies reported that 86% of networks are administering a universal developmental screener to in school-based settings across the state. So they are at least conducting universal developmental screenings of four-year-olds and that they administer that screener to more than 18,000 publicly funded pre-K children. The department also continues to provide professional development on supporting young children with disabilities and their families. So the department presented sessions at the 2023 Teacher Leader Summit and the 2023 Early Childhood Conference including promoting inclusion in early childhood and accelerating learning in early childhood settings. And the department continues to provide a young children with disabilities community of practice with training for early childhood administrators on improving child outcomes and data hygiene practices when using gold. Those were the focuses in quarter two. A little bit more about the Teacher Leader Summit and the Early Childhood Conference. Those took place from May 30th to June 3rd in New Orleans at the Convention Center. More than 750 early childhood professionals attended the 2023 Teacher Leader Summit. And that summit included 71 early childhood sessions on topics such as using data and making data informed decisions language and literacy in the preschool classroom, and engaging all families in the community. Approximately 2,000 teachers, leaders, and staff attended the 2023 Early Childhood Conference, and that provided not only two days of high-quality sessions, but also opportunities to network with colleagues and rec recognize the early childhood educators' excellence across the state. Some of the topics covered were how to make the most of their time teaching and specific individualized ways to support children. And we're very excited that there was a lot of excitement and praise following the second conference as well. You know, we had a very successful first conference, so then the pressure is on to have just as good of a second year. And we're really proud and happy to say that we did based on the scores that we received. Um, participants were surveyed on a range of 1 to 10 and on that range 9.4 were very likely to recommend the conference to a friend or colleague and then the other questions I'm not sure why they were on two different scales quite honestly but the other questions were on a scale of 1 to 5 and in terms of being very satisfied with the service received we received a 4.7 4.7, very satisfied with leaving the conference with concrete ways to improve themselves and their work. Um, 4.5, very satisfied with the quality of the content of the sessions. 4.6, very satisfied with the engagement during sessions and on. So we're very, very proud of those results. Our consultant tells us that that's actually very, very high and very good feedback for our conference. And the department is also specifically directing supports to directors and their success. So the department in quarter two supported directors by providing outreach, support, and monthly webinars for new directors. We know how difficult and challenging it can be to enter into this field. And so we are providing that direct technical assistance to new directors. We also launched intensive technical assistance efforts for the transition during quarter two of the CCAP attendance tracking system from TOTS to Kinder Connect. So that included site visits to assist sites in finalizing their setup of the new system. We provided a round of ARPA stabilization grant funding to more than 1,300 providers in the amount of more than $63 million and we opened in quarter two the application round for a final round of grant funding. We awarded the second annual Early Childhood Teacher and Leader of the Year awards and recognized them 
at the 17th annual Cecil J. Picard Educator Excellence Awards Gala. And we offered the fourth cohort of the Louisiana Early Leaders Academy, which provides participants with leadership development, system thinking training, and collaboration opportunities with peers to strengthen their business practices. Some updates from quarter two on the child care assistance program specifically. As I just mentioned, the department transitioned to Kinder Connect as its mandatory attendance tracking system for all CCAP families. This is a web-based provider portal that we hope it's used in some other states, saves time spent on administrative tasks while minimizing the possibility of fraud. And we're really excited because that transition to Kinder Connect is just the beginning of the implementation of a new, more simplified application process for families and payment process for providers. So we are working with the Kinder Systems vendor to build out those systems as well. And I am encouraged and excited to think that when you have the attendance tracking system and the application system and the payment system all in one software system, it should communicate more easily with each other. So very excited to see the start of new data systems or the continuation of new data systems. And there you see the number of CCAP children served in quarter two in April, May, and June. I have a series of questions related to this, so bear with me. <laughs> um, I think it would be helpful to see a comparison of children served from previous years so that, so that we could really, again, to understand the full scope, um, along with a breakdown by age of the children served. Um, so again, because we know we had this real focus of birth to three-year-olds, because we see, do so well with our four-year-olds that are at risk. But who are we serving for those, you know, infants, toddlers, twos, and threes? And and this is me putting a business hat on. Like I'd really like to see a year-to-date budget with the number of children served. So like, if we're going off course or we need to think about funding. Where, where could there be some shortfalls along the way as we, as we think about a sustainable system long run? I mean, I, I know I have to do that every time I, I sit down with a board member. They want our year-to-date actuals, and I think it would be helpful if we were able to look at year-to-date actuals with funding with the number of children. And then just because legislative session was the way it was and we had a lot of conversations with elected officials, there's, uh, for each quarter, what's the average CCAP cost that you're, you, you all are calculating as the department? Because if you, if you look at the average cost per, you know, per age group for, um, for the rate, it's different. And there was some confusion there. And so I think that it would be helpful both in this body and in the commission body to understand what the average CCAP rate is for a particular quarter and why it's that way. And that would help back up the numbers related to the number of children served by age group. And Libby, not that I want to provide any foreshadowing around the work LPIC is going to do, but any type of cost modeling that you guys do in the future, this would lend itself nicely to that yeah, work. Yeah, and we're going to update ours. This is like having our mind in this space, too, to be able you know, to help support the community. Because it's a workforce issue, it's access issue, it's a quality issue there, too. And having good fiscal management. And I know with the work with the micro centers that have been done in EBR and some other places, if, if you're going to have these these little ones, you have to have good fiscal management. And I know that the state is always trying to do that too, but if the advisory council can understand that, would I think that that would be education well, well made. Thank you. My apologies. And then here you have the report from quarter two on the publicly funded early learning sites. By day. And finally.
finally we have the upcoming I'm sorry. Okay, gotcha. Quick question mm -hmm. though. With the number of type three centers that are, are going down, and I know they kind of flip around a little mm -hmm. bit. Is there a way we could get an explanation if you have one of why we're losing a few here and there? I think that we lose some for reasons you would probably guess. I think we lose some because they serve a small number of children. You have data on it, so I guess I'm not. They don't give us an answer when okay. they're closing as to why. Karen, real quick, on the previous slide, um, since Lydia brought up the number that are moving, but the difference between April and June, we're looking at over 500 children. Um, and is, is there an explanation on that? Or, I mean, I know that there were some issues previously with children falling off the internet. Could that have been? We actually see that natural attrition every month. That just historically, we see it every month, every year of the program, before there's a wait list, during a wait list, that there are some children who age out, there are some families who move away, there are some families who don't use the service or given the opportunity, you know, under utilization to re-engage and, and never return. And so this but actually happens each month. I think that's why, as we as a body, understand the attrition rates, um, that would help understand the system more. And the reason that, you know, what you often see when there's not a wait list is you have that attrition, but you don't see the numbers drop because then those seats are filled. But with the wait list on, it only goes down until you reach the point where you're financially able, as we are now, to roll people off of the wait list and refill those seats. Okay, before we go to public comment, can we back up just a moment and can I get a motion to receive all that information we just got? Thank you, Livy, in a second. Thank you, Dr. Odinga. Okay, um, so do we have any public comment for the quarterly report? All right, hearing none. Um, can I get a motion to receive the consideration of 2024 council meeting dates? Motion, thank you, Livy, in a second. Thank you, Felicia. Okay, so now here you see the upcoming meeting dates. There is an additional meeting this calendar year scheduled for November. Um, we are not currently anticipating policy to bring to the council at that time, but we will have the quarter three report. And then you see the 2024 meetings, and I would anticipate you know, that in February and May we'll be bringing policy, state plan, revisions, etc. in addition to quarterly and annual reports. Speaking of the state plan, um, are you all convening work groups of uh, partners? To we will in the spring, yes. Thank you. We will look at updating that. I think that will be an issue, yes. Any other comments? Any public comment? All right. Um, so that does conclude our agenda. Um, and so do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Thank you, Dr. Odinga. Timely and a second. Thanks, Libby. All right. Thanks so much.